At Amadeus for Developers, we use GitHub for all our open source projects and we like a lot the idea, first of all, of having the, all the technical content in one single place. And also we work with code on almost a daily basis. We're very, very familiar with the process. So we thought it would be great to have a documentation that we can treat the same way we treat our projects, our SDKs, our DIM applications, code examples, etc. To create a community, you really need your members to feel like they are contributing and that their voice really matters. And MKDocs allows you to do that. So, um, as I said, developers can easily create issues, feedback, questions, so you can interact with your audience like that. You can also collaborate using uh, pull requests, as Anna mentioned, which makes users feel like they are uh, helping to improve the overall user experience. But overall, I would say that documentation or content in general is key for community building. Hello and welcome. My name is Laura Vash. I'm host of the API The Docs podcast and my co-host is Alex Pojar. We have two guests here for this episode, Anna Solaku, who is developer advocate, and Mathieu Pinsovai, who is customer success specialist. And they are both in the developer relations team at Amadeus for Developers. So welcome. I will ask Matt first if you would tell us a bit about the context of your team and what is your roles therein? Hey guys, thanks for having us. So yeah, we uh, work for Amadeus. So just to give you a bit of context, because most people in the general public don't know us, we are an IT provider for the travel industry. So we provide all the technology to power travel and we cover all the different travel segments. So anything from your flight inspiration search to booking, hotel reservation, we're even involved in rail, cruise, insurance, payments and, and many more. And uh, we are really a big player in the industry. So just to give you an idea, we process millions of bookings uh, on a daily basis. So if you uh, took a flight a couple of times in your life, chances are we were involved at one moment in the trip. And uh, me and Anna both work in the uh, Amadeus for Developers team. So we're basically the entry points for all the Amadeus APIs. So our role as part of DevRel is to, of course, advocate for the APIs and to make sure that our uh, community is uh, as successful as possible. So as the customer specialist of the program, in a nutshell, my mission is to talk to our API users on a daily basis, uh, guide them through their journey with Amadeus, advise them on what technology is best for them, share industry knowledge, and collect feedback on uh, what to improve. And Anna? Hello, and thank you so much for having us here today. So I work as a developer advocate at Amadeus for Developers. And one of my main focuses is around developer experience. So anything related to SDKs, prototypes, and documentation. In the last couple of years, we have worked a lot on the documentation since we know how important it is for a good developer experience. When you have such an extensive program to take care of, and you're doing an amazing work of that, we've seen the portal and we've seen uh, presentations at API The Docs before. How do you have the time and how do you keep yourself educated about APIs and the industry in general? Uh, yes, so on my side, I speak to our API users a lot. Uh, and to me, that's probably the best way to learn about uh, our APIs on the general industry. So being customer facing is sometimes seen as a chore. Uh, but for me personally, it really helped me grow and learn. So you're first to learn about your APIs in a functional way, what there's designed to do, what the limitation on possible use cases you can use them with. Uh, so yeah, if I could give an advice to anyone looking to learn, so try to get involved in support. Um, also, when you talk to developers, don't be shy to ask about the projects. So why did they choose a specific technology? Uh, why did they do um, an implementation the way they did it? Most people love to show off about what they built. So yeah, don't be shy to ask them about their work and you will learn a lot. As for the industry knowledge, so we're lucky enough to have a lot of resources, Amadeus. We're surrounded by uh, a lot of experts. So regularly talking to internal developers and product managers will also take you a long way. And I would like here to compliment that uh, as a developer advocate and more developer advocates in the team, we do spend time in customer support because as Matt mentioned before, that's the best way to learn and educate ourselves. I remember when I joined Amadeus, I was trying to get used to the APIs that we have and read the documentation and the API reference. But I realized that the best way was to talk in with customers. And that's very connected also to the documentation. Since we see a lot of questions coming uh, from different users, recurrent questions, 
And this is a clear need that these questions need to be answered and documented properly. So every time we document something, then we see the drop of these recurrent questions. So when you got into this industry, you had a source to learn the jargon and the concepts, but developers mm -hmm. who come to integrate with the APIs, well, they don't always know that. How do you bridge this conceptual gap? Okay, so for that, we use several tools in order to help them get to know the APIs and be more familiar. One of the first thing is that we use Swagger for the official API documentation. So in our portal, for each API, we have a small explanation of what the API is doing, where technical and non-technical people as well can understand and help them if it's the right decision to use this product. And then we get into the more technical uh, phase of the API with uh, Swagger. So in that part, developers can see the data model, the request, the response, and all the endpoints. And also for the website, for the portal, we have um, an interactive functionality. So developers can interact and make an API call directly in the portal. But we don't also stay there. We try to go even through that. So we have a Postman collection, which is one single place for developers to find our APIs and play with them. So as I mentioned before, we have an interactivity with a portal. But if we want developers to get familiar with some more complex processes, for example, if someone has to do the flight booking where you have to call multiple APIs and also get the output of one API call and then pass it as input for another API call, etc., this is very, very easy through Postman. So developers just have to add their API key and the API secret. And also they can find through Postman several code examples as well in different languages. And also we use Postman a lot for internal customer support. Matt uh, would have more details for sure to tell you about that. Yeah, actually, I'm a big fan of Postman. So to me, it really taught me how to use our APIs and how to actually understand them. Having uh, Being able to call an API without writing a line of code and seeing how it gets structured is uh, very good for, for non-technical people, but also to offer support. You can check uh, in a very easy way if an API is down and uh, what it's actually supposed to do. So can you elaborate a bit? How are you helping developers besides all of this that you already mentioned? So we have built the developer guides, which today is a public repository on GitHub built with MKDocs. MKDocs is an open source framework, which is a static uh, site generator that is used heavily in the documentation. I'm sure people that work with documentation, there must be familiar with this framework. And our documentation, contains different tutorials and guides, and it follows the docs as code approach. That means that code and documentation, they're created and maintained equally. Why did you choose docs as code? And uh, can you say a few words about what actually docs as code means at Amadeus? Because yeah, you already said that uh, code and docs uh, maintained equally, mm -hmm. but can you share a few more details about it? Yep, definitely. Um, at Amadeus for Developers, we use GitHub for all our open source projects, and we like a lot the idea, first of all, of having the, all the technical content in one single place. And also we work with code on almost a daily basis. We're very, very familiar with the process. So we thought it would be great to have a documentation that we can treat the same way we treat our uh, projects, our SDKs, our DIM applications, code examples, etc. And also that would allow us to, in the developer relations team, to collaborate in a more efficient and easy way. And apart from that, we thought that through the GitHub repositories, we're able to gather feedback easily because our users, they're all connected in most cases on GitHub. So they're able to find the developer guides and create pull requests and issues directly on the repository. So it's a very good way to get developer feedback. Can you see the main advantages of using Toxes code or have you ever not used Toxes code? Uh, that's a good question. So at the beginning of the program, we had the challenge of, okay, not only we realized that we need to have more tutorials and guides, but the question was like, which is the right place to add all the content that we want to help developers? So a few years ago, we started writing a lot of blog articles that they had a lot of functional and technical information. But we realized that maybe that's not the right place, but we need a proper place 
in order to add all the tutorials and guides that developers are going to use. That's why that also was one of the reasons why we started working with NK Docs. Now the advantages that we see based on our own experience, apart from having everything in one single place, it also makes it really easy to update it and work efficiently. So as I also mentioned before, it's very easy to collaborate since we work with issues and pull requests the same way that we work with our coding projects. And thanks to Git branches, we also protect the repository from breaking changes. Apart from that, the history tracking, I would say it's very easy for us to see what changes we have been doing the last months, but also for developers, they can see the history and all the previous commits. And something that I personally like is that I can work locally on my favorite editor. So I clone the project, I work with the editor I like, I do the changes locally without even needing to be connected on internet at that time. And also I can run NK Docs locally to review the changes and how the website would look like before I push the changes uh, on GitHub. And do you see any disadvantages of Docs code or where is the edge of adoption now? I would say that uh, I don't really see a disadvantage, at least from the developer relations part, but I would say each company and each team has different methodologies. So one of the, I would say not disadvantages, but challenges was to make sure that everyone in our team were in the same page and that we everyone agreed. And I have to say that the results were really good because also other teams in Amadeus, the SMK dogs, and the way Docs as Code works, because they didn't really know about that. And some product managers, they hadn't much experience on that. And they were really happy. So the last couple of years, I have done many, many demos to other teams to show them how it works. But I would say it has been challenging, especially if you talk with people that they're not very technical and they don't know how GitHub works. But then when you show them how easy it is, even for non-technical people, to use it, they just need to have GitHub account and they don't even need to use an editor. They can do directly some changes if there are small changes through the pull request on the web. Okay, you mentioned Amkey Docs quite a few times. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about this tool and why does it work for you? Uh, yeah, sure. So we are a big fan of MK Docs. So it's a tool all based on a Markdown. Uh, and it's easy to use, easy to collaborate with it and easy to deploy. Uh, it has uh, out-of-box search functionalities, so you don't even need to install or configure anything specific. Uh, you also have a custom CSS editor, so you can change the appearance really easily. Uh, there's responsive design, so it works well on mobile devices, code blocks, anything you need to cater for developers, really. Uh, so overall, the framework itself is very nice. But we also like it uh, as a way of collaborating within the team, also to create a a sense of community uh, with our API users. As Anna said, it's very easy for developers to just create a few pull requests to uh, create some issues, and it's a way to interact with your audience. So how does it create a sense of community? Can you share a bit more? Sure. Um, so yeah, to create a community, you really need your members to feel like they are contributing and that their voice really matters. And MKDocs allows you to do that. So. Um, as I said, developers can easily create issues uh, with feedback, questions, uh, so you can interact with your audience like that. You can also collaborate using uh, pull requests, as Anna mentioned, which makes users feel like they are uh, helping to improve the overall user experience. But overall, I would say that uh, documentation or content in general is key for community building. If you can respond to users' pain points by creating guides, resources, they will feel like they're being listened to. So in our program now, we're lucky enough to have uh, some contributions coming from the community through blog articles or even SDKs. So we always try to promote this content through our channels, which fosters this sense of community again. How does it all come together between the pull and push requests? It's easy to lose sight, but are you still creating the right documentation? And is everything up to date with the overall picture? Or did you lose sight of some change in the real reality of the offers? versus whatever is documented. How does that come together? Again, I think the the main thing you have to keep in mind here is to really listen to all your users. And then from there, if you track everything, you can really prioritize what you have to improve um, on what you don't. So again, once you are able to collect this feedback in, a, in an easy and structured way, you can then decide where to focus your attention. 
And your internal customers? So internal documentation, is that different? Do you have a different method for this? So yeah, our internal documentation serves a different purpose, but the way we uh, maintain it and interact with it is the same. So basically the, the core idea is to, that everyone should be able to easily find information in one single place and everything should be up to date. So for that, it's a good idea to have someone in charge of kind of keeping tabs, making sure everything's updated and still accurate. Uh, and this is particularly important for people that are customer facing. So in order to have one single voice, you really need to pay attention to that internal knowledge base and make sure that everything's accurate. Mm -hmm. Can you put this into the perspective of number of people, as in how big is your developer relations team? What roles does it encompass? In, and how big a team is the this internal documentation serving? I mean, these concentric circles, what, what numbers are we talking about? And how big is the API? Uh, so in our, in our developer relations team, we have five people right now. So as I said, um, each time we speak to, to customers, I'm, I'm not the only one doing support. So uh, we all interact with our users. So by having this internal knowledge base, we can all have uh, one single voice and be on the same page. So each time we notice an issue that we were not aware of or a specific limitation, we will document that right away. And it's a good way for everyone in the organization, not just our team, to be uh, aware of what's going on with our customers and with the APIs. Correct me because I might recall this wrongly, but from prior conversations, you have Amados for developers, which is has an open part, but then you also have uh, APIs only for partners, right? Is it the same developer relations team? So we will have two different frameworks within Amadeus for Developers. So you have the uh, open API part where uh, me and Anna work right now. Mm -hmm. And then on the side, you will have the uh, what we call enterprise API, which is what's being used by all your um, industry leaders, let's say. In that mm -hmm. case, uh, these customers will have a dedicated account manager and they're being uh, closely followed too. Whereas in our case, we try to look after the general community in a self-service way. Now, that's what I remember, that you had to separate the team to serve different modus operandi well. And what is the way that you make the internal documentation semi-permeable between these teams? Do you mean to kind of have one consistent documentation across teams? Mm, not necessarily on the facts, but I guess when it comes to customer success, be that enterprise customers or API endpoints, basically maybe on trial period, there is learnings that you can give through to each other, but of course, there's such a thing as too much information. How do you do this? I would say that it's there are two kind of standalone products. So most of our enterprise users will use uh, SERP XML APIs. So we don't necessarily interact with them, but more on a, on a business um, on a business way. So for example, we will send them specific leads that want to have access to more specific functionalities. And now our role is to more uh, make sure that the expectations are the right expectations, right? We don't want to oversell or mm. to promise things that will not uh, that will not have any enterprise feature. Yeah. So in terms of the APIs, they work in a different way, but uh, we manage uh, customers in in a similar way, in a sense that we're always honest, we're always open, and we never um, try to upsell anything. So. Considering everything, what is the biggest challenge with API documentation? What would you say? To me, the biggest challenge through uh, my experience working with developers, it's to make sure that our users can actually find the documentation. So we get a lot of people asking questions that are already covered in the docs. So making sure that everything is accessible is key. It sounds a bit obvious, but it gets trickier when you have a lot of resources to deal with. So in our case, we have uh, tutorials, code samples, SDKs, blog articles, and it's not always easy to expose everything in one single place. And the second thing I would highlight, which we already mentioned, <clears throat> is to make sure that all the documentation you expose is uh, still accurate and up to date. Uh, and this is a bit tricky in our specific industry uh, because with our APIs, we deal with things such as flight offers, so for example, in our Swagger, you have the possibility to directly test some APIs, but if a departure date, a flight departure date is then in the past, the API will return an error. So having to keep up to date a big catalog of API can become uh, a bit tricky. And if I could add also something here, I would like to share from the developer advocate part that sometimes is kind of challenging the technology knowledge that we all share in the team. 
for example, I'm familiar with Python and I know Java, but I'm not familiar, for example, with Node.js. And sometimes it's a situation, okay, how I'm going to help a developer that has a question about that? How I'm going to properly document something that is related to Node? In general, what we were doing until today was to have SDKs in eight different languages and demo application and prototypes in many languages and technologies, but then we realized that it's very hard not only to maintain them, but also to keep quality. If I'm not familiar and there is no one familiar in the language with a specific language, then we're not able to maintain it properly. That's why what we did a couple of months ago, we split our GitHub organization in two parts. So we have the official GitHub organization with the top SDKs that we're very good with. We know the technology very well and a few prototypes that we maintain on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the other work that we have done and also is done by the community, it's on another organization in which we have explicitly mentioned that this is maintained by the community and we cannot guarantee that everything will be up and running and maintained. But that has been one of the main challenges and also it was not an easy decision for us to make. When did you make this division? It's about two months ago. Do you have any feedback from it? Not much feedback, to be honest, but at least there are less kind of questions or issues that we cannot fix. And the developers really respect that if we say mm -hmm. we don't maintain that. And of course, you're where you're more than welcome to contribute, etc. But we see the developers, they prefer quality than quantity. Mm -hmm. If I can add to that as well. Uh, so going back to the point as well, to me, it's all about... Um, making sure your users have the right expectations. So it's totally fine to promote community content, but you have to make sure that uh, everyone knows you're not going to maintain it and that it's coming from the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something very interesting, another new initiative that you're duplicating some content visually in a YouTube channel. Would you tell a bit more about that? Yes, uh, sure. We reached a point that we wanted to improve uh, our documentation and see what other types of content we can build. So we thought of repurposing the content because we have a lot of tutorials and guides that are written, but we don't have something on a more visualized way. And personally, I really like watching videos because sometimes when I read long documentation, I get a bit, I lose my focus or I just want to read quickly and then I realize I lose information. Or some other time, if it's something very complicated, I read the documentation, but I haven't understood everything. So a lot of times, Personally, and I'm sure more developers do, the, we watch the video tutorials in order to be able to understand a technology or a product better. This is how the idea started of creating video tutorials. We have been doing it since two years or so, and it's very important, especially for some cases that are complicated. For example, if you want to build a flight booking application or a hotel booking application, there are several APIs that you have to call in that case it makes sense to build a video. And also when we build videos, we use Postman in most of the cases because we want it to be language independent. There are many developers that they use uh, Python or Java or other languages, and we want to focus on the functionality, not often on the programming language itself. For the programming language itself, we have other videos, mainly about our SDK. So for example, how you can get started with Python SDK, etc. Where do you put the signposts in the text documentation for this? Because this is serving both, well, cognitive accessibility, but also I assume that it also does give that, that overview before going into the, the details knee deep. So if I would see, if I would go there, okay, I want to integrate with this API, but how do I do this? Where do you put the signposts and how do you figure out whether that's put in the right place? To be honest with you, that's a very good question and it's also a challenge that we face. So what we have done today is on one point in the overview page of APIs, especially the most used ones or the most complicated ones, we have a resources section. So in that section, we add several links. Also, we have in the blog articles as well, some links that they go, for example, to the YouTube videos when we talk about something to the YouTube video as well. And the same way with the developer guides that are hosted on NK Docs. When we have some use cases that we describe, we also connect them to the video tutorials and also the other way around. So from the videos also, we try to connect, uh, to have a proper link to the written text as well. But I believe we have uh, room for improvement and more things to do, but this is how we do it today. 
And something quick that maybe I would like to mention at that point is that the way we try to build our documentation is not in a way focused on, for example, API, uh, for example, a tutorial about the flight offer search API or a tutorial about the travel recommendations API, but we try to focus on what use cases developers can build because usually the API names don't have a meaning behind them. So sometimes if developers go to our portal and they see 37 APIs, it will be very hard for them to go one by one and see what they can do and read the documentation, etc. That's why we try to say, okay, how you can add a baggage in your flight. And then we explain which APIs you have to use for this flow, etc. Okay, I have a, a closing question. What do you want the audience to remember after this podcast? It's both for Anna and Matt. So on my side, I would say try to really look at your product offering with a fresh set of eyes. So if it's the first time you're trying to build something with your technology, what would you do? So anyone, no matter the level of experience, should be able to look at your documentation and understand the next steps. And on my side, I would say get out of your comfort zone. To give you a personal example, I really love writing. But when I realized how important it is to have also visualized content and make uh, tutorials, I started doing that. I never enjoyed it, but when I see the result and the views and the comments, that is really fulfilling. So I think we, it's, it's important to get out of your comfort zone and try to come up with new content and ideas that your users might want. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this, and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidadocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well. <laughs>